This Week in Startups is brought to you by SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. Save time and money no matter what you ship or mail. Try it free for 30 days and get a free 10-pound scale when you visit pb.com slash twist. Salesforce Essentials. Jumpstart sales and support by leveraging the world's number one CRM at a startup price point at just $25 a month per user. Go to salesforce.com slash twist for an additional 50% off and a free onboarding call. And Segment. Segment Startup Program has exclusive deals with the best tools and resources to become a data expert. To see if you qualify for a free account worth up to $25,000, go to segment.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups, the podcast. I, Jason Calacanis, do twice a week, sometimes three times a week now because the ads are sold out for six months in advance and 200,000 people are listening to the show. And we're just blown away by that. Thank you so much for making it so motivating for us to do the show. You write us reviews on iTunes. You shout me out on your Twitter and your Insta with the at Jason handle. You email producer Jackie. Tell her how much you appreciate her Emmy award-winning production of the podcast. You talk about Sir Charles and Master Nick, all these great people who put the show together. And today on the podcast, a long-term friend of the show, Phil Libin, You know him because he created Evernote uh, and also uh, many other things, which I'll get into. But he's been on the podcast a couple times back in December of 2010, episode 101 and episode 320 in January 2013. Welcome back on for your third appearance. The trifecta, the hat trick has happened. Phil Libin, welcome back to This Week in Story. Nice. Nice to be here. That's three times a week. That's that's some heroism right there. uh... Here's the thing. You're doing a podcast now. Uh, you do it once a week, once every two weeks. What do you do? Fortnite? What Something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's we try it once a week. And is it not for you? Because I know you to be a thinker and a talker and a debater and a person who likes to maybe explore ideas and themes. Is it not one of the most enjoyable moments of your week? Yeah, yeah, it's great for me. It's because I have a staff that actually does all the hard work. So I, yeah. it's definitely therapy for for me. I will, all I have to do is show up and, and talk. And that is exactly what people don't understand about what I do here. They're like, how can you have this amount of production? And I said, I just eliminated lunches. <laughs> I used to go to lunches. And you did too. And what was the result of us doing lunches instead of podcasts? We both became fat bastards. And we can both say this now in all honesty, because I tipped the scales at 213 pounds at my worst. I was, uh, I was over 260. And I am now 189. da 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 Lost 14 pounds this year, and I'm one pound away from my 15-pound weight bet, and I'm going to win the bet. Wow. You, on the other hand, you were so fat. <laughs> How fat was I? 85 effing pounds you lost. Is this correct? Yeah, I think like 90. Uh, but 90 yeah, yeah, yeah. pounds. I can, you know uh, what? There's a we're lot. friends, Phil, for a long time. <laughs> and I can tell you, when you stopped being a fat bastard... I looked myself in the mirror and I said, Jason, you fat bastard. (laughs) Phil did it. And you and I had a very tender moment. We went to Starbucks and we talked about it. We had those little little egg things there. And we had the sous vide egg bites. Yeah. And I have to tell you, I you you and I talked about it. I won't get into the total totality of the conversation. It had a massive impact on me. So for that I thank you. Wow, that's so good to hear. Well, because I shared with you, I am so frustrated with myself. Yeah. Because I have the ability to, I feel like a samurai, put anything on my back and fight any battle. Yeah. I wake up in the morning and feel like a samurai or Jedi. I feel like there's no mission you could send me on that I wouldn't have a reasonable chance of coming back with the majority of my limbs. Mm. It's just how I feel mm. at this point in my career. Yeah. But when it came to my weight, I felt so helpless. I felt so frustrated with myself that I couldn't get it under control. And you were very kind to me and said, don't beat yourself up. There are things you can do. And you introduced me to fasting, ketones, and you just pointed me in the right direction. And I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just dig into this fasting thing. And right after that, I started fasting. And I started thinking about it. I got Kevin Rose's Zero Fasting app, yep. which has all the circadian <clears throat> rhythm and this fast and that fast. And I just started doing it six days a week. Mm. And first, it was just the you know 13 hour fast whatever the circadian rhythm one you yeah. we fast when you're sleeping and then i started doing some 16 18 hour ones mm-hmm. and i was basically told myself i'll fast and i'll just go bonkers when i'm not fasting yeah 
And then I was like fasting and being reasonable. And now I'm fasting and being like you and Jack over at whatever. But anyway, I just want to say thank you because I'm now feeling much more like I have it under control. And I feel like it was a turning point for me when we had our conversation. Well, you thank didn't you. know that. That's very kind. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't, but you look great. And uh, you, you look, look great. Uh, thank I, you. I know what it feels to lose whatever, 25 pounds. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it feels like to lose 90. Tell me what it was like to look at yourself in the mirror when you got out of the shower naked <laughs> and you just see like the layers of fat and everything. And then you wake up one day and you see yourself trim. And you look in the mirror, you see your face, and you're not, you don't look like Ernie, you look like Bert. You just, you just assume that I'm not like, uh, like the guy from Arrested Developer that just showers and, you know, cut off jean shorts because, you know, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm afraid of seeing myself naked or something. Oh, yeah, that, that kind of <laughs> hilarious. But yeah. anyway, before we get into your new product that you're going <laughs> to debut for the first time here, and I'm really excited about it, uh, Sift, um, tell me what, um, what was it like? Yeah, well, um, emotionally, as a founder, <sighs> your energy, your emotion, tell me everything. Well, um, so I, I didn't, you know, I didn't set out to lose 90 pounds, um, but I'd always told myself that, uh, I, I made this really stupid deal with myself when I was in my twenties. Um, I was basically, I was, I was really obese since I was like 18, 19. I actually figured this out recently. I, I asked my mom to like send me old pictures of myself just so I could like try to figure out like, when did I get fat? Because I, I didn't remember. And so she sent me all these pictures and I was a really skinny kid. So I was like skinny at like eight, skinny at 10, skinny at 15, skinny at 17. And then there's like a picture of me at 19 and I'm fat. And so like somewhere, something happened around 18 or 19 and it just like, it just went downhill from there. And huh. so, yeah, so basically from my whole adult life, I just saw myself as, you know, I mean, I, I was, I was borderline morbidly obese. My, my BMI was like right on the border of like, not, not just obese, what is but that, like morbidly 33, obese. 33, 34, 35? 35, I think, or something like that. I'm yeah. down to 26 now, I think, or something. Yeah. I'm uh, getting there. Yeah, uh, and um, no, I'm 26 percent body fat now. I was like th over 30. Ugh, it's... Yeah, it was I, it was bad for me. I was um, so I basically said in my 20s, uh, I kind of knew I needed to figure this out, but I said, "Ah, screw it. I'm just going to not worry about it until I'm 45." Mm. And I said, "As soon as I'm 45, I'm going to like take my health seriously." But before I turn 45, I don't care. And that's like a super bad idea. Like I'm not recommending this yeah, to anyone. Yeah, it's terrible. Terrible thinking. Uh, I just didn't care. Mm. Uh, and then I you know, was about to turn 45. <laughs> and I thought, well, um, if I don't actually keep this promise I made to myself, you know, 20 years ago, I'm never going to be able to like trust myself again. So I yeah. just decided to start doing it. Talk about clarity, uh, focus, because uh, people are making fun of Jack on Twitter and it's, you yeah. know, the CEO of Twitter. It's very easy to make fun of Jack because well, it's he's the beard. a considered guy and the beard and yeah. he's, you know, He's woke at, in one sense, but he's also part of the free speech party. And he yeah. also likes to talk now. He's been on every podcast. so. Yeah. But it's, it's mostly the beard. It's The beard's a little weird. Um, my favorite was when he took over as CEO and he was on CNBC. Yeah. They're like, hey, Jack, the beard. And he's like, I don't feel people should be judged by their appearance. And you're like, that's true, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> but they weren't yeah. making fun of you. They just thought it was I a think great it beard. Kind of cool, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of cool. Yeah. But he said he's eating one meal a day and then mm -hmm. he has the craziest clarity he's ever had in his life. He's jumping in an ice bath, like mm -hmm. Vin, whatever, yeah. Hoff method. Yeah. He's all in. Yeah. What has it done for clarity for you? Do you feel like you're 10% more clear? You're 20% better at making products? What? No, I mean, everything's everything's much better. Um, yeah, so when I read I read the, the criticism that Jack was getting, you know, a couple of weeks ago, whenever that came out, and I was like, oh man, I hope, like what he's doing is totally reasonable compared to what I'm doing. So <laughs> like no one connects the dots. Uh, yeah, I think what he's doing seems, I, I don't know about the ice baths. I mean, I've, I've done some research into it. Uh, I just don't know what the science on that is exactly. But eating once a day is like perfectly normal. Uh, Sounds like humans used to do that. Yeah. I mean, you know, the evolutionary theories only go so far because they're, it's easy to make anything into, like you can justify anything by like pretending that that's what our frozen caveman ancestors used to do. But yeah, it's plausible. Um, it's plausible that we had a certain amount of food available to us at times and other times we didn't and we developed a system for storing fat yeah. for the winter. Well, I think I think when you think about um, kind of human evolution, um, the important thing to realize is we're not actually, we're not human. Uh, there's 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 kind of lots of DNA in us, uh, basically three major types. There's like 
the stuff in our organs, which is kind of the human DNA. And, and that certainly has not changed much in hundreds of thousands of years. Like we are very similar. Our, mm -hmm. our human selves are extremely similar to how we were 100,000 years ago. And that was right. obviously pre-agriculture. I mean, it was pre-pockets. Like yeah. it's not like we didn't have extra. We didn't have pockets. We didn't have yeah. things to like, if you found a bush of berries, like you don't have a plenty place to yeah. save them for later. You had to eat them right away. You're like, eat as many as you can. Yeah. So the human side hasn't changed very much. But then the other parts of us is the, is the gut bacteria. Mm. And, uh, and then the mitochondria and, and, you know, the gut bacteria changes, the generational cycles there are much faster. Yeah. So in, in a few thousand years, we've had many, many, many thousands of generations of gut bacteria. So they actually have had time to evolve to a different kind of diet. So I don't fully buy the evolutionary, like the paleo theories, because sure. they, they kind of pretend that the only thing that's evolving in us is the human DNA, but really right. we're mostly not human DNA. We're mostly gut bacteria and mitochondria and other stuff. But again, having said all that, the science is super convincing on, um, carbotoxicity, you know, restricting amount of sugar, restricting the amount of carbohydrates. These are reasonable amounts, doing some fasting. Uh, and yeah, and I feel amazing in, in terms of clarity, health, everything. Uh, it's not 10%. It's, you know, hard to quantify, but but ridiculously. I am ridiculously smarter and more focused and in a better mood than I was yeah. when I weighed 90 pounds more. Yeah. It, and this is something I think everybody just has to take seriously mm -hmm. because the what I f have found amazing is what a dramatic impact a very small change can make. Yeah. And I started doing some math on it, and I was like, well, cookies are 50 calories. Yeah. Like a, a cookie. So yeah. 50 calories. I'm talking about a normal cookie, not like the giant ones you get at Starbucks or whatever, like sure. that are the size of a pancake. Those are like 300. Right. But anyway, just take the 50 calorie Oreo, whatever. Mm -hmm. If a pound of fat or whatever is 3,500 calories or something, if that means there's some number of cookies in there, and mm -hmm. you eat a cookie every three or four days more than you're supposed to eat. Yeah. Uh, you might add up two pounds a year. Two pounds a year over 20 years, bingo, you're 40 pounds overweight. Yeah. And it, it happens slow. It, it, it does. And it happens slowly to me over the course of, you know, 27 years. Uh, you know, I don't know that the calories matter that much. Um, uh, there's there's a lot of flaws in, in, in kind of calorie thinking that mm -hmm. most people just don't talk about for some reason, um, which is basically, I mean, it's not really a, a, a friendlier way to say it, but if you're counting calories, like you're losing a lot of calories that you're pooping out. Right. So unless you're taking that into account, all of the calorie math is kind of pointless. Got it. So, and no one takes into account. So the That's calorie some math- some amount are just passing through you. A lot of it. Yeah. And it really, and it's not always the same amount. It really depends on all sorts of things. Right. So I've always found the calorie math to be a little bit like low signal. Yeah. There's, there's other stuff. What is, what that, is the thing you should, you should focus on? Uh, probably the best thing for most people to do is to get a, get a continuous glucose monitor, get a CGM. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you still need a prescription right now to get one. And so, but you should get one. It's super interesting and it's, different for different people. You, you can you can look at your, your your blood sugar levels in real time and you can see what kinds of food affects you how and what kind yeah. of exercise affects it how. And it, it's different from person to person. Yeah. And not only that, it's different for the same person. Like my metabolism right now is very different than it was two years ago or even last year. And oh. without knowing the effects, you're just kind of shooting blind. You know, we have this, we have this, this, I think there's like a central thing that's at the heart of, of this massive problem in the world, which is uh, we fetishize struggle difficulty. Mm -hmm. We like believe that important things are like really, really hard right. and it's bullshit. They don't have to be like, we're just conditioned that like losing weight and being healthy is this like Herculean struggle. Right. And so we believe that it's hard and then we put up with it being hard, but it doesn't have to be hard. You, like it's hard because everyone's doing it wrong. Yeah. Like the stuff that people we've been told to do is like incorrectly. So we've been Shh. doing food the wrong thing. It's ridiculous. Yeah, the food pyramid honestly is probably responsible for more like deaths in the world than just about anything else. If you yeah, maybe cigarettes or alcohol outpace the food pyramid, but maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. yeah. It's, it sounds like a horse race. Yeah. Um, yeah, alcohol's been around longer. Yeah. So yeah, probably alcohol like throughout the history of mankind yeah. maybe outpaces it. But just because it's had, you know, the food pyramid's only been here for whatever, 50, 60 years. All right, listen, this is a great topic. Um, I appreciate you engaging it. And for anybody else who's out there, I highly recommend just at least getting educated about this fasting thing. It's been tremendous for me. Um, and it really is like, you just stop eating at six or seven o'clock and then you eat breakfast, a reasonable breakfast, like some eggs or something, a couple sizes of bacon, you're good. There's, there's different ways to do it for different people. Yeah. Uh, and you don't have to fast and it doesn't have to be hard. 
Uh, but yeah, for me, the, the amazing thing for me is not that I lost the weight. I mean, 90 pounds is much more than I thought I would lose. Uh, but also it took six months to lose 90 pounds. And then I've kept, I've been at exactly this weight for now two and a half years. So it's like, I thought that I would gain it all back and I didn't. It's been two and a half years. It's like, it's yeah. not coming I, I back. I can't tell it you feels how, fine. how proud I am. I mean, the, you, as an entrepreneur, 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 investor to investor, I've always had great respect for you. You know that you've been on the pod now three times. Um, that's that's as good as it gets in terms of a compliment for me is the number of times you've been on the pod. And um, really just amazing. All right, when we get back, I know All Turtles is your latest investment studio, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, and everybody should take out the, check out the All Turtles podcast. Give it a uh, search. I've been on it. But when we get back- Yeah, that was you... our most popular episode, I think. So Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and um, you're going to show us for the first time SIFT, which is a news therapy app that mindfully unpacks contentious topics to reduce anxiety in a transparent and inclusive way when we get back on This Week in Startups. I know you're a busy founder, so I don't want you wasting time or money. Both of those things are super important. So I want you to avoid that confusion and that waste of time and money that comes from shipping packages, right? It is so much work to figure out what you're supposed to spend and which service you should use, but not with SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. That's right. Send Pro Online from Pitney Bowes lets you send packages and mail right from your desktop computer for as low as... $4.99 a month. Not $499, mind you, $4.99. No matter what you need to send, a package, overnights, letters, just click and send with this new offer from Send Pro Online. For only $4.99 a month, you can print and ship labels and stamps from your own printer. No going to you know, locations and waiting in line, all that nonsense. You can easily compare rates using their online software and You'll gain access to special U.S. Postal Service savings. That's USPS savings for letters and priority mail shipping, which I use for all of my books when I sign books and send them to people. So I want you to track your shipments and get email notifications when they arrive using SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. And here is an amazing offer. This week in startup listeners will receive a free 30-day trial plus a 10-pound scale to accurately weigh your packages. Just go to pb.com slash twist pb.com slash twist to get free 30-day trial right now pb.com slash twist and the free 10 pound scale save time and money and experience the better way to ship with a free trial from send pro online from pitney bows thank you to send pro online for supporting independent media like this week in startups okay let's get back to this amazing episode all right welcome back to this week in startups my guest is the one and only phil libin you can follow him on the twitter p-l-i-b-i-n he has um a company that's not an incubator Sort of a studio. I would say it's the studio model where you were given a shit ton of money. I think that's the term for it. You hired a hundred talented people. Uh, yeah, close to it. Um, we have about fifty some full time people on our staff, and then there's another you know fifty or sixty that are kind of working on different projects. God, man, it's so great to be you. You're so respected. People just give you a bucket load of cash to go build stuff. Uh, yeah, none of that is actually true, but. Sure, I'll, 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 I'll take the compliment. Well, I mean, you raised what for this thing? Was it public? You raised- We raised 20 million uh, about a year, about two years ago, or about a year and a half hey, ago or so. the pitch? I'm going to build stuff? Yeah. I'm Phil Libin, I'm going to build stuff. Yeah, the, the, second, the second, you know, the second fundraise is going to be, you know, harder. That's when we actually have to yeah. show some, some results, so- I mean, just to pause here for a now. second. I deal with entrepreneurs all day long who cannot clear market to raise $500,000 to build their prototype mm -hmm. or their MVP. You, because of the incredible success you had with Evernote, uh, you were able to walk in and just raise twenty million to say, "I'm going to build a couple of different projects, and one's going to break out." Well, look, raising money is not an accomplishment. Uh, raising money is, uh, you know, it's an obligation. So the more you raise, the more of an obligation you have. That's true. You got to uh, return a hundred now. Have to return a lot more than that, uh, and they expect uh, ten, twenty times. Yeah, um, five would be like okay, Phil, but. It, really, it'll, they want it'll, it'll 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 be more, but yeah. but the important thing is we're we're trying to build high impact products with it, and, and we're trying to kind of drive all of the nonsense and inefficiency out of the kind of conventional Silicon Valley method for for how we make products. Mm. We're trying to make things that make the world better. Um, what's in the nonsense? An, in an you mentioned way. the nonsense. What's the nonsense? What are people in Silicon Valley? What's the cruff that's built up now? Startups. The idea of startups. Startups are stupid. Um, this, all right. This idea. Welcome to this week in startups. 
Yeah. Startups I mean, are stupid. <laughs> yeah. Well, they are, right? And this is why... Wait, wait. Why are startups stupid? Unpack this. Um, so... I'm investing in 100 startups this year. Now you tell me they're stupid? <laughs> um, uh, let's say you are a... Let's look at any other creative industry. Okay. Creative field. Let's say music. Let's say you are one of the... Let's say like you're one of the one in a million Mozart level, most talented musicians okay. alive Lady today. Lady Gaga. Right? Uh, you're just really good. You don't have to make a music company. You just play, and the platforms have been created, you know, YouTube and others, where you're going to reach a billion people no because doubt. you're sharply talented. If you're one of the most talented writers in the world, you don't have to start a writing company. You just write. Yeah. If you're Long. one of the most talented filmmakers in the world, you don't have to start a movie studio. You make a movie and you, mm. at Netflix or HBO or something like that. But if you're one of the most talented, like one in a million Mozart-level genius product people, you have to make a company first. We have to say, oh, okay, uh, you have this great idea to change the world. Uh, great. First, become a mediocre CEO. Here's the Wikipedia page on how to make a startup, deal with mm -hmm. raising your seed money, get a board I got of investors. You. So there's an inefficiency to building this structure. And the structure is built so that you can have investors who get shares. And that's the architecture of this is really the funding mechani exactly. the mechanism. The structure is built for the benefit of the investors, not, sure. not, for the, not optimized for creating high impact products in an inclusive way. You found something better? Uh, I, well, maybe. We think okay. so. Uh, what and, is it? And, and, and the model works well in Silicon Valley, like because there's a lot of investors, a lot of really smart investors. Mm. Investors like you, like, 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 like other investors who are here know what investment means. You, like, investors here understand that when you invest in an entrepreneur, you're not doing them a favor. Uh, you expect that a lot of the time you're not going to see the money back. Yep. Uh, like this is the right culture. This is actually very rare. Like it's very rare I, in the world to have investors that understand what their role is. Yeah. Place uh, a bet, support the founder, get out of the way. 70% yeah. chance of failure. In a lot of other places, especially for startups, like investors think they're doing you a favor when they invest. And that's actually a really bad mentality. Uh, so- I experienced that in New York. The yeah, Silicon Valley States. model works okay here, mm. but it's it's crippling in yeah. outside of this country uh, right. and everywhere else. So what we were basically trying to do what this our model is is, is HBO. It's Netflix. Uh, we are we're a studio in that sense. We're a studio like Netflix is a studio. We want to make innovative products ourselves, our own mm. stuff, attract great people to do it, make them, distribute them, book the revenue, go full cycle, learn what we need to from the distribution to influence what we make in the future, mm -hmm. have have platform uh, effects and synergies, uh, reuse as much of the sales structure, technology structure, expertise structure as sure. we have, make things in a disciplined way. Uh, you know, the first, um, the very first famous person that I ever knew about that used Evernote uh, mm -hmm. was uh, Ed Catmull. Uh, the head of Pixar. Creati uh, creativity. He was on an episode. What episode number, Jackie? Put it in the notes. Here we go. <laughs> creativity. Yeah, yeah. Creativity, he wrote creativity Inc. Inc. Which is a fundamental. Which is one of the books that's like most fundamental to my thinking about all turtles. Oh, you have to watch this two-part episode I did yeah. with him. It was He's amazing. amazing. So episode six six five. He wrote me a letter. Uh, he wrote me a note. Um, years and years ago, right at the beginning of Evernote, uh, I get a letter from Ed Catmull, who's already been a hero of mine. Uh, we had just released a new version of Evernote and he wrote me this email. It was basically like 20 things that he hated about the new version of Evernote. And mm. I was like, holy crap. Like wow. Ed you're Catmull. getting notes from the guy who created yeah. Toy Story. Yeah, like Ed wow. Catmull knows about Evernote and uses it enough to actually like have a strong yeah. negative opinion about the new changes to me. So like I ran around the office, showed everyone. Uh, and yeah, and, and his whole thesis in Creativity Inc., right, is creativity is a process. Mm. It isn't this thing that like, it's not a bolt of lightning that's irreproducible. Um, there's the myth in, again, Silicon Valley startup culture that, you know, there's the myth of like the lone cowboy founder. There's the myth of the irreproducible uh, uh, creativity. There's the myth of the, you know, it's the way that Mark Zuckerberg, I think, described uh, Twitter, right? Which I think he said Twitter is a clown car that fell into a gold mine. Yeah. Um, all of that is kind of true, but it's also super inefficient. You can structure things. You can you can be a big company mm. that, that has discipline and structure in order to make innovative, creative things on time, on budget, on schedule, like mm. Pixar does, like right. Netflix does. Or you can be a big company like HP that has a structure that's meant to inhibit innovation so that they don't actually like innovate stuff because they're playing defense because they're trying mm. to protect their their existing product base. Yeah. So just because most big tech companies are structured to inhibit innovation because they don't want to disrupt their lucrative business mm. doesn't mean that that's the only way you can set up a big tech company. So right. we're trying to set it up the way that Netflix did. So we, we want to do to the tech industry what Netflix did for the entertainment industry. Got it. So uh, what's in it for the creators then? Because the creators have 
visions of grandeur and mm -hmm. they would like to take their company public, hit a hundred million in revenue, get bought out, whatever. Yeah, some of them do. And some yeah. of them want to make important products in the world and benefit and benefit financially when they're successful. And, and those are the ones so that we do want. So do you revenue share with the creators or you yeah, just they have equity. Them? So everything we do is set up under the hood as a, as a, as a separate legal entity. So they have equity in it. So we, it. we could spin them out or we could sell them or we can operate, we can mm -hmm. profit share. It's, it's similar to how, like, I, I don't think you can say that, uh, like if you're one of the top most, again, brilliant animators or filmmakers, like you want to go and make your thing at HBO or at Netflix or at yeah. Pixar. And like, you're going to have upside and you're going to have the, the creative control mm -hmm. and you're going to have the success. Uh, so that's what we're looking for for product people. Like, yeah. yeah, if someone who's trying to optimize for the illusion of how much independence they have, yeah, yeah. that's just not, that's not it, the right motivation. What does it take to make a great world-class app today on one platform, um, you know, com.com or... Mm -hmm. Evernote, whatever. I mean, just to scope out the 1.0. What is the number of collaborators, number of months to sort of get a, a solid 1.0 to market on one platform these days? So uh, I'll tell you what we do, which isn't yeah. which isn't everything, but we have a pretty tight filter on this. So we we build things that we can get to market in a mainstream way in 12 to 18 months. Okay. Uh, so we, we're just not set up. It would be inefficient for us to do five year science projects because we have a lot of like we're reusing a lot of people. Mm. Uh, we have a lot of experts that, that we have dedicated people for each project, but then we also have people that 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 rotate amongst projects as they're needed. Ah, like a product manager or a designer, or like IP lawyers and writers ah. and editors and user testers. Mm. Uh, and yeah, exactly. And then Got there's it. there's core dedicated teams. So everything we do is we try to when it launches launch it at a high production value. So like it doesn't feel like startup stuff. It feels good it's right. thoughtful it's like it's professional i like the Companies concept trust of it. taking out the 50 percent of what you spend in the first year that has nothing to do with the product 90 percent no come on like when, when, we, when we invest in things right uh um just when we, when we invest uh, i mean like me personally and, yeah. and you as an investor uh in in startups like in entrepreneurs like how much of the time when, when they're asking us for advice, are they asking about like what really matters, which is the product versus how much of the time are they asking about, oh, how do I fill out this round? How do I fire my co-founder? How do I deal with board drama? Yeah. How do I deal with this contract? All of I, that's the hard stuff. Yeah, I, I put it at 50-50. I think they spend like half their time trying to raise money and hire people. And then they maybe can put their head down for 30 hours a week yeah. and build product. I think it's more, but but even 50 yeah. is a pretty good amount. So, so we take well, that out. You unlock thirty hours of product. Yeah. I mean, is basically what you're saying. Uh, and we, and a lot of it is, uh, we have people that startups don't know exist, right? So, for, I'll give you an example at Evernote, right? At Evernote, um, the night before we were going to launch it, huh. I, we, we launched the free and the premium version at the same time. So we had, you know, it was a freemium model. So we had the premium version on day one. The night before we were going to launch it, I remembered at like three a.m. that I forgot to decide how much to charge for the premium version. We mm. just didn't set a price. Yeah, that would be an oversight. Yeah. So, We're going premium. Yeah. Uh, so, you know. You call... sound like Apple News Plus yeah. <laughs> or Apple Streaming. They're like, you're going to love it. Yeah. Here's some celebrities. We don't have a price. Yeah, Disney so... yesterday is like $7. Yeah. So, yeah. We, so we we had to pick a price. So, I, you know, I called up some co-founders and we had a, you know, a, 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 a hurry discussion in the middle of the night. And we picked. It was five bucks a month is what we picked. Uh, because we were, I was like. You know, science. It was like four bucks a month seems cheap. Six bucks a month sounds expensive. Five bucks a month, uh, that's, yeah. sci that's scientifically the like correct that. price. Right? I so like we that alchemy, it. yeah. And we did not change that price for six years. <laughs> right? And for six years, I knew that we had the wrong price because I remember picking it at random at 3 a.m. So I knew that right. my, my chances of having that be the correct price are zero. Yeah. But we didn't know how to do pricing. And mm -hmm. in those six years, by then, you know, we had we had A, B tested everything else like a million times because we were good at that. But we didn't know, we didn't have pricing experts. Mm -hmm because pricing experts don't hang out at startups. Mm. Um, so six years later, we finally hired the first person to uh, that actually understood how to do pricing. And I thought it was boring, but you know, when, I, when it was explained to me how to do it, actually, it's actually fascinating. So now I'm kind of a pricing expert. Mm. Uh, and then we started experimenting with the pricing and we basically doubled our revenue without changing the product mix within 18 months just by being smart about pricing. Uh. I've never met a startup that understands pricing theory but 100% of products that are released ought to have gone through a pricing exercise before they're released. Yeah. So now we have people that do that for That's all of so our great. stuff. Yeah. Same thing with IP. We have a dedicated staff that yeah, does IP. I mean, this IP. is like, you think about what Pixar did. They're talking to, and he talks about this in Creativity, Creativity Inc. The person who's writing the story is going to a meeting with people who have made all the other movies. Yeah. And they're sitting in a room with 15 people talking exactly. about 
the different acts, the different character development. Yeah. And they're getting candid feedback, and that's the word he uses, yeah. on it. So just that candid feedback, I think, is going to well, work and look, huge. Look at, so another myth. So I, I do a lot of work overseas. Most of our business is actually international, and even with Evernote, that was the case. And so I hear a lot of myths about Silicon Valley, and one of them is that, oh, but Silicon Valley is, is really good because we know how to fail efficiently. Uh, like, oh my God, no, we don't. Like, startups no. do not fail efficiently. Yeah. Like if I'm going to be a if I'm a first time startup founder and I get out of you know YC and I raise a three million dollar seed, like a million dollars into it, I could have convinced myself that it's a stupid idea, but I'm going to try to stay alive. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to spend three million and then I'm going to go back to my investors and get a bridge. Yeah. So I could have failed for a million dollars, but I'm probably going to waste five million to, to fail. Oh, so it's very capitally inefficient. Yeah. And it's very emotionally inefficient because there's all these people. Very talented people working in walking dead startups that everyone knows aren't so going many anywhere. Zombies, so many zombies. So who fails well? Netflix, HBO. Um, you know, HBO, Netflix, they make hundreds of pilots a year. Yep. The pilots are very much like startups. They're very innovative. They're a combined sure. team. They work really hard, nine months, 12 months, whatever it takes. A hundred percent of the pilots are technically excellent. Hmm. Your HBO pilot will not fail because you used the wrong cameras and ran yeah. out of budget and got into a fight with the caterers. Yeah. They know how to do that. They don't make yeah. the amateur mistakes. Yeah. So they don't put the wrong lens on. Yeah. They don't put the lens on backwards. Right. The, which is exactly why most startups fail, right? Most startup yeah. failures have nothing to do with their product. They fail because they're They don't amateurs. know pricing or they don't know customer, uh, how, to, how to talk to customers. They don't know anything. Right. Except hopefully they're one thing, which are brilliant at, but- you can't just know one thing. You have to know a thousand things to How many succeed. products has all Turtles made? When did you just start? How many products, pilots have you made? How many have you canned? Uh, Give us some broad strokes. So uh, so, so in, in pilots, if you're working on your HBO pilot, like it's going to be technically excellent. And then they're evaluated. And the ones that fail, fail because they don't hit their KPIs. Because mm. for like, they fail for good reasons. They explain fail. what a KPI is. Uh, and explain how you set KPIs. So it's a you know key performance indicator. Mm. Uh, you basically decide like how are you going to know whether something is working or not. Mm. You know you may it may be audience numbers, engagement numbers, whatever. You decide for yeah. each show or each product what you want those to be. And if it doesn't hit it, then then your your pilot doesn't get picked up. It gets canceled. And the team who worked on it really hard for you know a year, yeah, they're bummed out. They go drinking for a long weekend. But then they come back to work the next, you know, let's say Tuesday, and it's okay. Like yeah. the best people and ideas get recycled. They stay in economic orbit for 30 years. They make 10 more pilots. Right. None of this is how it works in Silicon Valley. In Silicon yeah. Valley, the failures are catastrophic and everyone scatters and they're very inefficient. Yeah. So what we've done uh, at All Turtles, so we have, um, we launched about a year and a half ago. Well, we started the company about a year and a half ago. We have one complete product that we've released in the market right now. It's called Spot. Uh, that came out about three months ago or so, three or four months ago. It's an AI for workplace harassment and discrimination reporting. Uh, really brilliant. I'm very proud of it. Uh, re we recruited an amazing team of experts to build it. Uh, my co-founder, Jessica Collier, just became the, the CEO of it. We have Each of our products has a CEO, has a management team, even though we're not running them as independent companies. They're all our mm -hmm. employees as well. Uh, and it's a, it's an AI for harassment discrimination reporting. You know, the problem is the vast majority of workplace harassment discrimination never gets reported. It's a terrible experience for the people doing the reporting and for the companies. Uh. It's, it's very hard to control the risk. Usually things don't get reported until they're a crisis. Mm. We have a, an AI that makes that much better, much easier. Uh, we, it's not the sort of thing that a startup would like would really sh want to build or could build because it requires a good amount of technology, but also like we have psychologists working on it. We have user testing. Yeah, this is complex. We have lawyers. There's a lot of stuff on I that. I mean, you're also wading into an area that is supercharged. You can't be cavalier about that. You've got to do it correctly. It's got to be done well. Yeah, it's got to be done well. And we're sort of signing up for doing it well. And so we started selling it uh, about three months ago. We have, uh, at this point, dozens of actual enterprise customers paying wow. for it. Uh, so it's going well. So that's our first example. And we have five more things that are, yeah. Yeah, uh, here it is. That is a uh, spot. So yeah, anyone can see it. It's free It's free for use to uh, to humans. Mm. Uh, and then employers can pay for it. But you don't have to wait for your boss to like sign up for it. You can, oh, okay. So you take the glass door type approach or the Yammer approach. You can get in there. You can start reporting stuff. Yeah. It, no, it, and it, then the boss there's can no, There's uh, nothing public. Claim it. So, right. So this isn't a way to like publicly complain about things right but yeah but you can so not you can like make reports in that way more like yammer yeah you can make reports yourself you can you can you can hold them uh oh, really? for yourself if you want if you don't want them to go anywhere or you can submit them anonymously oh. or not we'll submit them on your behalf and then companies can pay for the back-end management of it which is actually really good and it, yeah because you have that like um what was that like the 
you would always have that box where you could put notes yeah, in. What exactly. was that called? The suggestion box. The suggestion box, which yeah. became, in a way, for a lot of companies, yeah. the back channel. And then yeah. and those I think are terrible. Yeah. They're terrible. They're inefficient. Mm -hmm. This sounds like a much more efficient way. Okay, when we get back yeah. from this quick break, we're going to see the the second product coming out of Phil Libbins, All Turtles Studio. May I call it a studio? I think we're just a multi product startup. Okay, a multi product startup, AKA studio, when we get back on this week in startups. Scaling your sales team and your process is brutally hard. And this is where a lot of startups get themselves in trouble. They start to figure out sales, but it doesn't scale. Why doesn't it scale? Because you're not using Salesforce, which is the world's number one system for doing customer relationship management. Everybody knows Salesforce works best. Salesforce is the greatest, but you might be saying, is my startup too small for this? Is it too expensive? Well, I've got great news for fans of This Week in Startups. Salesforce Essentials is easy to use, out of the box, and perfect for startups at a great price point. I want you to go to salesforce.com slash twist, and you will get 50% off with an annual contract and free onboard training. Salesforce realizes that startups are growing fast and every dollar counts. So they wanna get you early and support you early and give you a half-priced system. Salesforce is awesome and it's gonna be set up instantly, same day. And you're going to be able to do everything faster and better. You're gonna be able to track your emails, track your calls and all the meetings, all from within your inbox. So I want you to automatically connect all of your support channels to Salesforce and start doing it right. When you look at a sales executive's resume, it says that they're Salesforce trained and they know how to use Salesforce. And when they come into your building and they're in your office and they sit there, the first thing they say is, where's my Salesforce login? How do I get to my dashboard? The world runs on Salesforce. And now startups can get a great price with Salesforce Essentials. That's right, Salesforce Essentials is 50% off. I can't believe it. Thank you so much to Salesforce for supporting This Week in Startups and for supporting the startups that watch This Week in Startups. So get that 50% discount. I'm not sure how long it's gonna last. I want you to get in there right now. Salesforce.com slash twist. Scaling is hard unless you're using Salesforce Essentials and then it's easy breezy and you're gonna get that startup price. So lock in your startup price right now. Salesforce.com slash twist twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest, Phil Libin, you know him from Evernote. He was at General Catalyst for a hot minute. He's still an advisor to them. And he's back on This Week in Startups for the third time. Go back and watch his episode from 2010, episode 101. So just type in Phil Libin, This Week in Startups, or Phil Libin, uh, yeah, episode 101. You'll find him. And he was also on episode 320. What's happening with Evernote? Are they going to go public? I know they got a lot of revenue. Uh, I hope so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I actually just met with uh, with Ian, uh, the the new CEO, a couple yeah. of months ago. I had a had a great conversation. I have no formal role. I'm you yeah. know, I'm a shareholder. I have lots of friends there, but yeah. I've I, I've stepped away from it formally. So I think things are going well. It's what yeah. it seems like, but I hmm. wouldn't want to say. Okay, so here we go. Let's open Sift, your newest app. Yeah, and news apps. You've picked two incredibly hard verticals. The first one dealing with harassment at work, and the second one trying to make a news app work here in the United States after every other news app here has failed. Yeah, so uh, definitely not a news app, although okay. uh, it, it it pretends to be. Hmm. Uh, everything we do at All Turtles is focused on, there's two areas we focus on. It's future of work and future of health. Okay. So it's all about how to change corporate culture, work culture, mm. and how to change future of health. And the future of health, really both of these are things that, that like I've been obsessed about for a while. Absolutely. A lot having of the health. lost 90 pounds and having a startup company almost kill you, yeah. And 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 and, and, and I'm trying to understand both of those things and why why they happen and how to, how to prevent yeah. them. So a lot of the stuff is productization of that. So SIFT uh, is uh, our, our second product mm -hmm. and it's a uh, news therapy. So the, the problem is... Uh, uh, news is making us sick. Like literally, the news is making us sick. Like, it's not it's a, filled it's, with microaggressions and anxiety, and anxiety kills you. It's not a it's not a euphemism. It's like the literal truth. The news, the way that news is done here in other parts of the world too, but but particularly in the U.S. is is literally making us ill. There's lots of research about that. What does that research say? I mean, just just the levels of of uh, uh, anxiety, depression, burnout are very yeah. high, and and people report 
the extreme stress and anxiety around the news. And it isn't just because, it isn't that like the world is that bad. Parts no. of it maybe are, parts of it are probably better than they've ever been. The problem is the news industry right now is set up to make you sick. Like that's not a bug, that's a feature because all of this stuff that's based on engagement, that's based on advertising, um, the whole, like they need you to be in a heightened emotional state to stick around, to engage, to click on stuff. Yeah. And the easiest the easiest heightened emotional state to manufacture is, is anxiety, it's fear, it's, it's tribal so resentment. Simple. If it bleeds, it leads. Tribal resentment gets you going. If yeah. you listen to Rachel Maddow or Ben Shapiro, yeah. they're like, when we get back, we're gonna talk about Bill Barr destroying America. Yeah, and it's 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 making and, us yeah. it's making us sick. Uh, so uh, there's been lots of approaches to this. Um, you know, lots of things around like the meditation space, about you know headspace, calm. Yep. Uh, which are which are interesting, which are effective, not just for news anxiety, yeah, for anxiety the first in general. In calm, yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a cool product. Uh, and a lot of there's a lot of advice about like maybe disconnecting from the news, disengaging. Yeah. I think that's super bad. I think like for some people that may work. For me, it doesn't. Like I get more stressed out if I'm if I'm not plugged uh, in. Yeah, me too. And I think it's super bad for democracy. Like the last thing we want is to have our stressed out citizens disengage yeah. from the news because then like everything's just going to get worse. Yeah. So I think a big part of our future of health and, and mental health and, and depression and anxiety burnout is how do you have a different way to interact with the news? So okay, that's where we made SIFT. It. So it's news therapy. So um, right, You're opening the app. I see here guns is the first story. So we're going right to the most anxiety producing thing in the world. Yeah. Consider the history and impact of gun rights and regulation. Two parts, 20 minutes, and it's got a beautiful um, illustration there, which I'm thinking is by design. And you know what? I am not feeling anxiety because I it feels like this is a considered thought piece. But uh, and I see education, climate, media literacy. Yeah. It feels a little PBS NPR ish, but maybe a little bit academic, like a Harvard Business Review. So yeah, it's 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 um it's carefully made. So the idea is we have we have topics, mm. uh, and we're going to do them in uh, six topics at a time. Uh, so we're launching. Uh, we just launched with the first two, which is guns and immigration. And then we'll have we'll have more Great. come out weekly. What happens when you click guns? Uh, so you click guns and you get this this topic, this module. Uh, ah. There's there's two portions. It is uh it is beautifully designed and illustrated and thoughtfully written. This is all done by humans. This is human curated, human written, human edited. We actually started out with a bunch of AI stuff and then totally canned all of it and backed away from it because we yeah. realized the AI was part of the problem, not part of the solution. Yeah, this. who made the algorithms and what are the algorithms going to do? They're going to go right to engagement yeah. and whatever people get anxious about. And and so the app is designed uh, uh, and tested. Like we we do before and after surveys and testing mm -hmm. on this. We did a, we did a three-month trial with about, I think, 15,000 users to actually gauge the effect on anxiety and burnout and, and information. So we know that it works. Mm. And it's basically set up to be a little bit slower. Mm. Like it's intentionally, you said kind of like NPR or something. Yeah, it's intentionally dialed down. Right. It's meant to be maybe like a little bit more active than Headspace or Calm. Right. But not nearly, like it is not trying to yeah. get you into a heightened emotional state. It's actually trying to make you calm while engaging. That's fascinating. So you merge Calm with a, you know, PBS or something or CNN and you get SIFT. And here, when you're looking at it, you could have led with a big, beautiful image of ambulances and tape around a, sh a mass shooting. Mm -hmm. You didn't. You put an illustration. Well, and the illustra they're all hand illustrated. Yeah. And, and like this illustration, I, I kind of love this one. It's, uh, it's sort of an American flag within the stripes or, or hands. There's, a, there's outstretched, outstretched hands and then, and then hands going the other direction that are making uh, kind of air guns, handguns. Yeah. And the original version of this, we actually had in, in, in the Red Hands, uh, we originally had, they were holding actual guns. Right. And it was way too stressful. Yeah. And so we like, we tested it, we thought about it a lot, and we, we replaced it with, okay. now they're just making like little handgun So now I'm not anxious. Noisters. I'm thoughtful. Yeah. And what so- What happens when I, how have gun rights, okay, the motivation for gun ownership in the US are multidimensional and so are views on- gun policy. Yeah, so basically each module is a series of steps and they're all there's a lot of tactile interactive stuff. The other the, the first part of this is is slowing it down. Yeah. The second part of it is engaging more parts of your brain, mm. giving you haptic feedback, giving you interactivity so that you feel like ah. you the news isn't coming at you, you are actually interacting with it. Yeah. Which is important to engage the different parts of your brain so that you feel healthier. Right, because the other option is to watch the nightly news or cable news or podcasts, which are designed to keep you engaged in heightened stents. And here, you you get right to the um, 
most interesting part about this, which is how many people favor, and if you go back and you look at the one before this, mental health restrictions on purchases. 89% of gun owners believe this, and 89% of non-gun owners believe this. Background checks, 77% of gun owners believe them, 87 So you can start to see the range. A federal database, hey, the gun owners don't want to be in that database. I understand that. I'm a gun owner. I wouldn't want to be in a database. Yep. Um, and primarily because, I mean, listen, I'm saying it here on air, but I understand what people's fear is. Like, yeah. now you see I have seven guns. You're going to come to my house to steal my guns. Or if you're going to do a coup and take over the country, you're going to come take my seven guns. I don't think that way, but I think a lot of people do. I think it's it's useful to understand that the philosophy here is we're not like we aren't pretending to be unbiased because that's not possible. And in fact, I think it's, a lot of what's gone wrong with our news is this pretense of not being biased. What we try to do is to be high quality, yeah. to always cite the sources, to explain the bias, sure. and to and like the experience that we're going for is people should be able to read this from. Mm. And disagree completely with each other, yeah. But do it in good faith. They right. should. They should. You should be able to read this. You and I should be able to read this and come away with it, like totally disagreeing on the issues, but not thinking that that we are that each other is a monster. You know what's so interesting like, I kind about of this? Understand your points of view, even if I don't agree with them. I, I have this discussion with people about immigration. I say to people, "How many people do you think we should take into the country?" Mm -hmm. And they say, "Well, like I think, like maybe no more than ten million. I'm like, "Well, we're taking in much less than that already. Mm -hmm. It's like low 1%, of, we're, we're accepting like 1% of the people in the country. It's like, well, how would you want to accept them here? Would you want to accept them based on their uh, a, a lottery merit uh, or based on their need, based upon uh, how they would be treated if they went back, like if they're seeking asylum? And mm -hmm. they're like, everybody says the same thing. Some combination of that. And I'm like, that's Canada and Australia. Yep. They have a point-based system for immigration. And the, our whole discussion is either right now Trump, build the wall, we can't accept anybody. Mm -hmm. And then liberals saying, there should be no walls and no borders, which is also ridiculous. Like, yeah. you, how can you have no borders? Everybody would just go to whatever system has the best healthcare. Everybody would be in Stockholm right now. Yeah, and I think, so our, our second module is is immigration. <laughs> um, well done. Uh, and, uh, and, and the idea here is, okay, well, what are we trying to, what are we trying to optimize immigration policy for? Right. Are we trying to optimize it for economic benefit? For cultural reasons, let's and who's let's economic unpack benefit, those. right? Like, is it the economic benefit of yeah. rich people who need workers, of poor people or middle class people who want the jobs that immigrants might take? Mm -hmm. Who exactly is yeah. getting hurt or benefiting from this? So, for example, in the immigration track, there's also two tracks. Usually, most of our modules are set up with two tracks, and roughly they break down into what's happened in the past, like, and like, uh -huh. how do we get here, and where might we go? Gotcha. Like, it's like what, how do we get to where we are, and then yeah. what are some options for going forward? I mean, we're not going to yeah. say what what we think the right option is, but what are some of the options for going let's forward? Let's catch up. Let's catch you up on so you ha can have an informed discussion. Right. And then let's inform you about what the potential solutions right. or outcomes are. But, I love it. But do it in a way where you're not reading, you're interacting. Like we, as one of our design philosophies when we were making this and testing it was we didn't want people to say, I read SIFT. We wanted them to say, I use SIFT. SIFT Got is it. a product. It's not, See, it's not a publication. A, this is why you're one of the best at making products is that you can actually distill down what you're doing and communicate it. Like this is what Ed Catmull and some of the people right. over Lassiter or whatever, you know, he's got some problems. Um, but a lot of those folks were able to actually codify and explain the best practice, explain why they were doing what they were doing in a Pixar film. Pixar films have very specific Mm -hmm. Rule sets, world building, character development, etc., and, and they and they kind of are able to explain it to each other. And this yep. is a really good point. You want people to use it. So what happens when you hit the impact? Or well, whatever? so so this is the uh, for example the the cultural identity aspect of immigration uh, talks through uh, well what was our understanding of yeah. of immigration before. All of these things are, are interactive, and and it's hard to kind of explain just by talking about it. But you can there's a lot of haptic feedback, which is also important. I see important. that when you swipe, and it's a swipe metaphor. Yeah. So um, you he, you have here an interactive element which says drag to connect each group with the year they were granted citizenship. Yeah. African American, Chinese, Filipino, Native American, white. Yeah. And, and you, you see here, whites were given citizenship in 1790. African Americans right. in. Oh, what do you think? Uh, I think that would be. Uh, right, sometime after the Civil War, right? Yeah. 1868? Yeah, so I think 1868 is probably... I go with 1868. Yeah, yeah, it's probably right. Okay. So Chinese. Like, Wait a second. Did people know that Chinese were not allowed to be citizens in the U.S. until... 
I didn't some point. know that. No, well, yeah, it's it's true. Uh, so, so you, I don't want to put you on the spot. I didn't yeah, know yeah. a lot of these either. So. No, but I mean, the, and the and the band here is 1924, 1943, 1946. So you could flip a coin. Yeah. So you uh, you, you you can you can connect. Uh, yeah. And each time you do this, there's there's some tactile feedback. Oh, nice. Uh, and the point of it is, you feel like your brain gets engaged. You you just yeah, the fact that you're, you're sensing it through your it. fingers, it's kind of a combination of like making a little Zen rock garden where you're like, you know, you're drawing circles in the sand or you're yeah. moving rocks around, except yeah. you're moving facts around in the news. So it's- And that fires your neurons. Right. Which then builds the connection in your brain that might last a little bit, or you might take yeah. it um, a little bit tighter. When we get back from this quick break, I want to see more. Mm-hmm. And I want to see what the business model is here. Yep. How will this actually make money when all the rest of the media business is collapsing when we get back with Phil Libin for his third time here on This Week in Startups. Every time I talk to a product manager at one of my investments, I ask them, how are people using the product? What's the most popular feature? How is it growing? Why are people churning? And a lot of founders and a lot of product managers don't know this basic information. Here's an easy way for you to understand how people are using your product down to the feature level, super granular. That lets you know, are you working on the right things? What if you're spending 100 developer hours this month on a feature that nobody uses, and then you don't know which feature is blowing up in your system that everybody's using? Because you are not using Segment. Segment helps you answer these questions definitively. Go to segment.com slash twist, and you will get a free Segment account worth up to $25,000. I'm not even kidding. Segment wants to capture the startup space, and they are giving listeners to This Week in Startups exclusively $25,000 in product. Go to segment.com slash twist. You can cut down on all this annoying integration by just putting a couple of lines of code in and bing, bang, boom, all of your data is in one place, and it makes it easy for you to understand all the user journeys. So this is complete. When you order their segment, when you get the startup program, Starting your conversations with what you think or what your intuition tells you or what you feel and having this back and forth for 45 wasted minutes. Start with the data. What are the users actually doing? Segment allows you to do that. Everybody is using Segment. Go ask 10 of your friends from successful startups. 10 out of 10 will be using Segment. segment Segment.com slash twist. Get the 25 large. This is 25 large. Go see if you qualify. I want you to go to segment.com slash twist and apply to get a segment account with $25,000. I don't know how long Segment's gonna do this for, but it's a great deal. Segment.com slash twist. Thanks again to the team at Segment for making a great product that so many of my portfolio companies use. And thank you for supporting our mission here at This Week in Startups to educate and inform and inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs. Okay, speaking of which, let's get back to this amazing episode. Welcome back, and thanks to our partners for making This Week in Startups possible. If you are part of the 2% of the audience that does not want advertising. There's literally one to 2% of you that say, I want to have an ad-free experience. I get that. Our partners get that. If you're at the station in life where you want to throw 10 bucks a month at the show to support it, we've got a surprise for you. You're going to love it. You can go to patreon.com slash TWI startups, TWI startups. And for 10 bucks a month, you get your own RSS feed, which gets you the show on average, I would say three or four days in advance without ads in it. So you get your own custom RSS feed and this show with Phil Libin that you're watching on whatever day you're watching it. Imagine if you got it five days earlier than everybody else and it was magically in your RSS feed. Sometimes you'll get three or four shows in a day or a week and everybody else is getting two a week and you don't have ads in it if ads are not your thing. If you're part of that wacky group of people who don't like advertising, we have a product for you. And I'm going to start doing some specialized uh, content just for the Patreon group. It's an experiment. We got a couple of hundred of you doing it. Thank you for supporting it. Or a couple dozen, I should say. All right, my guest today for his third appearance, Phil Libin, one of the most considered, uh, caring, thoughtful uh, people here in Silicon Valley in my experience, and I met everybody. It's one of those people who every time I spend time with, I feel like it was a good use of time and I want to spend more time with. This product has blown me away already, Phil. And nice. you know I Thank always you. be candid with you. Well, we have a brilliant team. Uh, Gabe Campadonico is actually heading it up. And Gabe was, uh, he was our, our head designer at Evernote. He's the guy that ah, made the Evernote logo. Uh, cool. Along with Trump. lots of other stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Gabe is the is the the CEO of the, of the SIFT project. And he's built a really, really brilliant team around him. 
it's really great. And I have to tell you, all other news products, I had some apps originally. We moved inside to email newsletters because mm-hmm. we couldn't get apps to work. Yep. Apps, there are news apps in China and Japan, Smarter News, et cetera, that mm-hmm. have become juggernauts. Yep. None, And they all work off AI. They all work off personalization. They just yeah. reinforce the thing you're trying to unravel, which is if it bleeds, it leads, and you know, clickbait, link bait. Those have failed here in the United States because Twitter has a monopoly and Facebook has a monopoly on news in mm-hmm. your feed with your friends. Yep. So why do you believe that SIFT will make it work when everybody else, including me, including Pulse, including Flip Flipboard, no offense to all of these people, we all fell flat on our faces and couldn't make it grow. Yeah. Why are you going to figure it out? Um, well, how does this make money? That was the other cliffhanger. So uh, um, the reason we're doing this is because I, we don't have any interest in making a news app. Like no one's going to use Sift for breaking news. No. It's a therapy app. It's like uh, it's it's more like Calm. Mm. It's like Calm. It's like Headspace. Got it. But instead of trying to shut everything out, you're actually trying to engage a little bit with the world mm. in a in a calm way. So got we're it. we're so positioning this. It's health. It's wellness. Wow. So I think that's it's I think it's in the health and wellness category of the yeah. app store as the primary category. Did you ever read Steve Pinker like Our Better Angels yeah. and all this yeah, yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. Like it reminds me of Steve Pinker because yeah. he has a very interesting view of media, which is. You all got it wrong. Yeah. The world is getting better. Your chances of dying by being murdered or in a war have dropped precipitously. Everything has gotten better, yet we feel it's worse. 2018 was the year, and hopefully 2019 will be a little bit different, but 2018 was the year of making everything seem worse than it really was. Mm. And by doing that, making it true, actually making it really bad. It manifested itself. Yeah. Yeah. Like we have, uh, the, the there's a lot of things in the world that are really bad. But the way that we talk about them, because yeah. of the incentives that the media has, makes everything worse. Mm. Uh, and this is this is trying to push back on it. So it's not a. Um, uh, we actually started out. You know, we're an AI company. Yeah. We started out with a lot of AI in this, and the AI was originally meant to basically figure out. We knew that the writing would be done by humans. Yeah. But we wanted the AI to like find the topics that were most argued about. Basically, we said, let's make an AI editor and have human journalists. Mm. And we kind of realized that actually, no, like the AI is is irrelevant here. It's actually part of the problem. Let's just have human human everything. Yeah. Uh, and it's not a, that much content. This isn't going to flood you with content. There's, no. there's, a, there's Less is more. There's a small number of topics and they're meant to be meditative experiences that Fascinating. we do. And, and we measure it as a health app. Like the, we measure the effectiveness not in terms of clicks. We measure the effectiveness in terms of, well, how do you feel before? How do you feel after? And we survey it and we, we, we know mind, what's working and what's not. In, uh, in your mind... Are there topics where things are actually horrific and horrible in the world, and how do you deal with them? As an example, there are a group of people who are suffering from depression and anxiety at a very severe level because of climate change and what people are considering this whatever third extinction event or Mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, There are a group of people who believe that it's an intractable problem. And when I was in Japan, I know that you like to spend some time there as well. Yeah, I just got back. Oh. How are the blossoms? I was there. Peak cherry blossom season is amazing. Wow. My, my, my cherry blossoms my, just came in. My phone wallpaper is a picture I, I took. I see that beautiful uh, in black and white. Um, where do you stay when you're there? You have a hotel you like? Uh, your, yeah, you know Andaz, we. Andaz, Amman. What you <laughs> What's your story? I had, I had lunch at the Amman uh, in Tokyo That's where a I few stay. days ago. Yeah, oh, a Lord. higher budget than me. No, I stay at super cheap, efficient well, uh, at Japanese. It, It'll be okay. Yeah, uh, um, we'll get there. Uh, we stay, I, our office is in, uh, is right near Tokyo station, which I love cause you look out the window and oh, wow. watch the bullet trains come in. And so there's, there's three different, like very efficient business hotels ah. that I stay at, but they're all like, they're low the end. The lobby of they're the Amman. End. The Amman is insane. You have to just stay for one night. You'll get, if you stay for two nights, you will get the experience. It's looking out on the Imperial palace. Yeah. You go out, you take a run around the Imperial. This is what I would do. Yeah. I wake up. I go take a run around the Imperial Palace at mm-hmm. six thirty in the morning. Right. I get a mile, two, three miles, and whatever. I come upstairs like an American in my sweaty clothes. I go right to the restaurant. I eat the full Japanese breakfast. Mm. Baller. It's incredible. It's good. Then I go upstairs, I take a nice hot shower, I jump in the pool on the forty fourth floor. It's a forty story high pool. Just like the lobby. You know how the lobby's forty feet high? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, forty stories. It's on the fortieth floor. Forty stories. I jump in the pool. They bring me a little fresh fruit. They cut it up nice. 
I'm in the robe. I do a little reading. I get some email done on the iPad Pro like any other investor on my superhuman. And uh, yeah, then I go do a lunch. It's a nice life. Uh, yeah. Oh, my Lord. That is the most incredible hotel I've ever stayed in. The, Hotel the, in Tokyo. On my current trip, I stayed at the uh, the Premier Super Hotel, which is like three blocks away. It costs, Premier and Super. Premier Super Hotel is the name. It's like- 450 a yeah, night? 125. 125 a night? 125 bucks oh, a night. that's what my breakfast costs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Literally, the Amman Hotel is 1200 no, a night. 1200 is a good deal. It's like- it could go up as fifteen. Could yeah. be a lot more. Uh, oh no! During cherry blossoms, I looked. It was I think twenty five hundred. Yeah, it was, a, it was a lot. So if you go for five nights, you're in for fifteen grand. I mean, yeah, this so one twenty five bucks, one twenty five a night, and the rooms are. If I stand in the middle of my room, I can touch every wall without moving, just by like. Yeah, I'm gonna hard pass on out. that. Yeah. This room, looking on the Imperial Palace, yeah. has its own traditional Japanese plunge bath in it, mm-hmm. made of stone. Yeah. And they give you like a bunch of shaved tree, <laughs> a bag of like shaved tree um, shavings that you throw in there and it makes the whole thing into a spa. And then they make you an array of little rice treats and cakes and put out all these beverages and everything for you gratis or part of the room. Unbelievable. Anyway, um, so... Back yeah, to, I would stay there if I could find a way to do it without anyone on my team knowing that I was actually staying there. No, what you do is you yeah. bill. It's very simple. Yeah. You bill yourself for the eighty percent of the room and put twenty percent towards the cost of the thing. And you just tell everybody if you want to do that too, you can. We'll put two fifty towards the room there. You pick up the other thousand. Here's what you do. But anyway, when I was there, on multiple occasions, people were not having kids, mm-hmm. and they said that they felt. And they were not as ambitious as entrepreneurs like the Japanese used to be where they wanted to build global businesses. Mm -hmm. They wanted to just build businesses in Japan. So that was very interesting. It's a big change from Sony wanting to buy Hollywood, Columbia Records, you know, pictures, whatever. Um, And they just didn't think, one person said to me, it is unethical or immoral to bring a child into this world because of climate change. Mm -hmm. And this was the most disturbing thing I'd ever heard. I believe we could solve it, but I have people I know who I'm close with who feel a sense of helplessness Mm -hmm. about climate change. What do you think when you, have you done climate change yet? And do you think that there are problems that maybe are intractable and people should be anxiety produced and have depression about? Uh, So we are, we are, we are doing climate change is one of the, one of the future topics will be out in a few weeks. Mm. Uh, And uh, I think that, I think that there's a way to talk about every topic that that is optimized for our goal, and our goal is not to like our goal is not to make it seem like it's not a big deal. Our goal is to reduce the anxiety and helplessness mm-hmm. that people feel around it. Right. It could be very important, but then we want to talk about okay, how do we get here? Again, the same structure as always. How do we get here, and then where might we go? Mm-hmm. And to do that, and to present that in a way that's tactile, that gives you space, that makes you feel like you have some agency, that it's not just like everything piling up at right. you, where you are the victim of the news. You're right. not. You have you have agency in it. So yeah, so we are we are tackling the, the difficult subjects. Mm. Um, in fact, only the difficult subjects. Like, we're do you not, think we're not... climate change is intractable at this point? What do you personally believe, Phil? No, I think it's I think it's totally solvable. Yeah. Um, See, I think the same thing. I don't understand these people who think that we can't reverse this or manage it. Well, I I, I understand them, and I think understanding is important. Um, uh, but I think it's a difficult problem, but I think it's I think it's solvable, and I think yeah. we're. I think we're going to be solving it. But part of that is also- How do you think it gets solved? I'm just curious, and we take a little tangent here, but you're a considered person, so I'm going to uh, allow the witness to expand here uh, on his uh, feelings. What do you think the likely outcome is? Raising sea levels, you know, extinction of species, mm-hmm. imbalance in the oceans, uh, global warming, heat, carbon. What do you think solves all this, and who- yeah. Most importantly, is going to be the leader in solving this. Well, I think I think one of the things that, pro- and, and again, this is somewhat speculation on my part. I'm not an expert in, in this field at all. Uh, it it feels to me like we're sort of way past the point where we can pretend that we're going to stop it, that we're going to like we can't conserve our way out of it. Mm-hmm. I think that needs to be a lot more active. So I think there's going to be some fairly massive investments in dealing with the consequences, but dealing with them in a way that lets us, yeah. you know, continue to be and live on the planet. Uh, so there's just there's going to be huge amounts of public work projects to rethink what cities are like to build new structures yeah. that 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 deal with rising sea levels. Um, at the same time, I think uh, hopefully we're we're getting close to peak meat production. 
mm-hmm. uh, in the world. Like now that uh, now that m- the middle class in China and India is like wealthy enough to actually be able to start eating meat at roughly the levels of the U.S. are like that's about right. There's still there's still like some hundreds of millions of people that can probably. You know, oh yeah, they will. Meat. They'll show up. But we may, hopefully we're getting close to the peak of that. Yeah. Just as we can be a lot smarter about how to actually produce yeah. meat. Um, so I think it's a combination of of technological changes and just like very large civic investments that yeah. are going to be necessary. But um, I I think it's survivable and and it'll be different. But mm. I think it'll be okay. Uh, yeah. We just have to. We do have to take it very seriously. Yeah. That I think the thing that has made so has broken so many people, mm-hmm. and I mean it's one of the reasons Calm is doing so well is people feel a lot of anxiety about the news. Mm-hmm. They feel a lot of anxiety about what's going on in the world, and I think one of the things that's sort of broken um, people's spirit is it feels like Trump is such a um, uh, inconsiderate leader mm-hmm. or non considered or non intelligent, not surrounding himself with intelligent people. Like it's kind of a clown car and he doesn't have people in permanent positions. So you get the sense that the leadership that we put in there is incompetent or nefarious, you know, evil, whatever you want to think. It's some range of incompetence, ineffective, whatever. And that kind of breaks people's spirits. But when you think about what will solve this problem, it's just trade-offs. Like I was reading today in the news that the the walls that they built in New Orleans to kind of keep the water out um sea levels are rising so fast that they just realized they spent like 14 billion dollars on the one of the largest projects in the history mm-hmm. of mankind like one of the greatest projects and it's going to basically save us for four more years there's a trade-off and a very hard discussion that has to happen of does another 14 billion dollars to save another four years another three four billion dollars a year in expense make sense or does letting that city as tragic as the sound sounds, maybe go underwater or some portion of it go underwater and relocating those people to really amazing free homes far away enough that in 200 years they will not be underwater either. Well, yeah. And, you know, uh, traveling internationally really puts us in a different perspective because uh, you kind of realize how we are not a first world country anymore. Mm. Like our cities don't look like serious cities compared to what cities look like in Korea, no. Japan, China, no. uh, really anywhere, any any of the more like recently developed places in the world. For example, I was just in Singapore. Uh, it's pretty vertical, mm. right? Like, is Singapore going to suffer from rising ocean levels? Well, yeah, of course, in one sense, because it's, yeah. it's, it's right there. Yeah. But on the other hand, like the vast majority of activities there aren't happening on like little two-story buildings that are at sea level there. Right. It's a very vertical city, just like most serious cities are. No, I mean, if you And we're look- not. Like San Francisco is just perplexing to me. Like San Francisco people, is a bunch of three-story like ramshackle houses. It's ridiculous. And it's like you go to Tokyo and you're like, oh, I'm going to this building. And they're like, which level? And you're yeah. like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, there's the ground floor level. There's the second floor level for the offices. There's the third floor for retail. And there's the fourth floor for the apartments. Yeah, and you're pro, like, pro tip, B1 is where the good food is in most of the places. The B1. first B1, the first basement level is usually where you get the best That's food. That's the best. Yeah. And here's the other thing. I frequently am going to restaurants when I'm there. And I agree, like the, the more ethnic or like down low, like really good katsu is going to be on B1. Sure, it makes total sense. But then if you want to get the wagyu, whatever... The fact is, like, they don't give the top three floors to two rich Russian, Chinese, whatever, oligarchs to park their money in, Mm -hmm. and nobody's up there. They put eight restaurants up there. Yeah. Or they put the lobby of the hotel on the top floor. So when you go to the Ritz in Rapungi, the best views are for everybody. We really stay in different hotels, Jason. Yeah. I, Ritz, prob- I probably eat better than you do. You can afford the Ritz. It's like, three fifty a night, four hundred a night, and it's got the view yeah. of all Tokyo on the top floor. I know it's great, and uh, the Roppongi Hills Club is the best view in all of Tokyo. Uh, I, you know, I went there. Masi Yoshisan's people took me there. Nice. Ten yeah. years ago, the Roppongi Club. I prefer to take the money I would have spent the hotels and just pour it directly into dinner. What What is your favorite right now in Tokyo? What is your favorite meal to have? Are you a katsu guy? Are you a, a beef guy? Are you a sushi guy? Are you a udon noodle guy? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's kind of an, it's kind of an impossible question to answer. I mean, I just love Japanese food, and uh, mm. I have mm. lots of places that, that I really like. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I think like the food is probably my number one reason to go. The food, the people, the architecture, design, yeah. the efficiency. I had, I went to this old restaurant. People took me there. This VC firm took me there. They had a private room. It was in a house, mm -hmm. like a three-story house, nondescript, and but they had Michelin stars. Oh yeah, and. Yeah. They just do tempura. Yeah. Well, everything in Japan is very specialized. Like right. That. In so fact, is... like you wouldn't go to a place that has multiple things. No, of course not. No. So this tempura place, they made, they brought out shisho, shiso leaf, yeah. which and, I love. And you got to say that anyone who's only had tempura in the US, like it's ridiculously nothing like what actual tempura is. Like there is, Correct. There is no tempura in the US, period. No. Forget it. Yeah. I mean, it's just That's a That's not me being a snob. That's just like a statement reality. of fact. Absolutely. Yeah. And you they, couldn't, you could not, you could not profitably operate a tempura restaurant in the U.S. The labor costs are would be so astronomically high, you could never do it because you have people sitting there doing one piece at a time, one piece at a time, perfectly yeah. to make your six pieces. And we're Gavones, we want sixty pieces. Well, and it's like one master chef who's had fifty years of training per eight diners, and that's this place. And oh my lord, they had the shiso leaves, and I love that. And I was like, wow, that's a really fat shiso leaf. And they're like, well, it's two shiso leaves. And I was like, oh my god, this is incredible. And they're like. And it's got uni inside. Yeah. And oh my lord. Okay. How is this going to make money? How is SIF going to make money? And when can people get it? So they can get it now. What? Uh, it's available? Uh, unless something horrible has happened in the time continuum between when we recorded this podcast and, <laughs> and when it's supposed to come out. If, if the polar ice caps have melted, and the sea level's right, and we're all drowning, and yeah. you're at the bottom of the ocean or on the top of the Empire State Building... Chances are, if you're actually successfully listening to this podcast, still alive, still alive, and there's still an app store, you can go and get it from the from the app store. It's iOS only for now. We'll, Can't we'll have my an Android listeners version. Probably downloaded all the episodes yeah. and are listening to them on solar powered thumb drives. Yeah. On the peaks of yeah. the remaining skyscrapers in the world. Well, you know, when I when when I when it's we twenty bucks for six months. When we finally get Cheap. to build a base on the moon. Uh, mm -hmm. We can put a little radio station there with all of your episodes beaming sure. back to Earth. For sure. That way, once civilization is destroyed, okay. as soon as somebody reinvents the radio, they'll be able to get all of your received wisdom and they'll, they'll back, know exactly back from the moon. And services to make. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's available now, uh, and um, there's only one business model except allowable at all turtles. Everything we make is the same business model. It's only direct revenue. There's no ads. There's no like mysterious mm. like do something with your data. It's only we make money when people or companies pay us to use our product. That's it. So you have purity there. Uh, yeah, and 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 it's not that there's necessarily something wrong with other revenue models, but they set up structural conflicts of interest, which I which I really yeah. don't like. So it's all it's just paid. Uh, so Sift is a subscription. I think it's nineteen ninety nine for six months yeah. or something like that. So uh, 20, uh, with a free 40 trial. Forty bucks a year. Amazing. Yeah, it's forty bucks a year with a. I think you get a seven day free trial that you can look at all of it. I think you're going to have great success with this. I hope so. What uh, does it cost you to make a module? Is that like? Uh, it's like ten thousand dollars to make. No, that, it's a lot. 000? It's 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 a lot. I don't have the exact figures, but I think it's uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 probably close to a hundred k. Uh, well, um, actually, in 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 a group of six, it's a few hundred k. So I don't, I haven't done it because we we, and we you make know them what? in parallel. Launch a couple a month. So you're every not, month or every week, I get one. Yeah, we're gonna do seasons in effect. So we're gonna oh. do weekly for a couple of months, and then take a couple of months off, and then do them weekly again. Oh. Again, the point is not to make these topical or newsy. Like you should be able to reuse these at any time as right. like as therapy as and update them and update them yeah so it yeah, is it is it is a wellness and therapy app which I think makes it a lot more longer term uh, than necessary but yeah I think trying to make this ad supported would absolutely kill it because then you'd be setting up the same incentives that that are that are breaking uh, that are causing the problem to begin with who who backed all turtles by the way. Uh, a primary A round investors were Salesforce and General Catalyst huh. uh, and then we have lots of other well-known people and then uh, we will be doing we are right. perpetually raising money when you spin these out it's an opportunity for me to put a little uh, bit of capital in them yeah absolutely no? okay uh, yum yum uh, we Let may or may end. not spin anything out but, uh, but right. yeah well, keep me in mind because I kind of I, I kind of I, I got a thing for the news well we will uh, let's talk after the show okay all right thanks again Phil uh, we'll see you on your fourth visit when you come in for the Grand Slam uh, but congratulations on hitting the triple today you do, got I get the like a vars do I get a varsity jacket or something at four you know we're going to start doing that I want who uh, else has been Emmy on? Emmy award-winning producer. Ah, there's a number. Well, Br Brian Alvey, my partner, on a lot of businesses comes on, and then there's the news roundtable. So sometimes we'll have reoccurring guests. I think five is good. I think like you need like a you need some I kind of. I think five a... timers. We give a we give a we should get a hoodie or like a a, a fleece or something. It's a blazer. I like I like the idea of like um like a nice running jacket or something that just says twist five. A tracksuit. 
Tra- like track an Adidas tracksuit. Yeah, totally. Adidas tracksuit. All right. Emmy Watering producer Jackie, take a memo. Uh, ask uh, somebody in marketing to come up with an interesting swag idea for five timers. Uh, it'll be your five time jacket. We'll see you uh, soon. Everybody follow Phil Libin. And please, uh, if you're hearing my voice right now, I want you to download Sift and I want you to go ahead and pay the 20. Just go pay it because you know what? Phil's out here making great products to make the world better, world positive, humanity positive. And you're listening to this, so I know you got a little cheddar. Give him the 20. Give it a shot for six months. Maybe even tweet it. Uh, the name of the app to Sift. The name. Of Sift the, News Therapy. Sift News Therapy is the name of the product. Um, and All Turtles is the name of his building with people in it <laughs> that do things. He doesn't want to call it a studio. But the place where people aggregate to build world-changing products is called All Turtles. If you want to work there, I'm going to guess Phil at AllTurtles.com works. Yeah. Yeah. All-Turtles.com. All hyphen turtles going so 1988. Yeah, well, no, it's 99. I'm sorry, 98. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the hyphen. Allturtles.com without the hyphen is someone's site about their pet turtle. So. Got it. Also, Every- also good. You can work there too. If you don't know the all turtles theory, go to the Wikipedia. We'll see you next time on this week in startups. Bye bye. Mm-hmm.